Okay, this is lecture two of Gelzo's reconstruction. Um, when we left off the uh, first lecture, um, the 1865, it's a series of special elections, has returned a number of folks, uh, many of which were very similar, if not exactly the same people as um, the previous ruling order. Uh, some of those folks are elected to be uh, the senators and House of Representative uh, members from each state. So they come to Washington, D.C. to be sworn in, uh, and that's where we're going to pick up uh, Lecture 2. So uh, before we talk about uh, what happens when uh, those newly elected uh, officials from the South show up in Washington, D.C., I want to talk a little bit about who uh, the folks who will are most prominent or most um, persuasive in the United States Congress are. We call them radical Republicans. Uh, the radical Republicans, uh, who are they? Well, uh, a fair number of them, not all of them, but many of them uh, are also are originally abolitionists who believe that uh, slavery needed to be abolished prior to the war. Uh, and they view this uh, abolition of slavery as an imperative because they believe uh, slavery not just to be a bad economic system, because they believe that as well, but primarily because they believe it to be a sin. Uh, and when one is sinning, you can't be a little bit sinny. You're either sinning or not uh, in, in this construction. And so uh, the abolition of slavery can't be this sort of slow process. Uh, it needs to be halted immediately um, and so the abolitionists have an absolute hard line on this. And many of these abolitionists or many of the radical Republicans are also abolitionists. And so what makes them radical is that they believe in this crazy notion of equality. Uh, at the bare minimum, the radical Republicans believe in equality before the law. And that's going to be a driving idea for them in this Reconstruction period. Now, the uh, thing that to, to bear in mind is that these radicals are a minority uh, in the Senate, even though in uh, 1865 uh, the Senate is comprised of a, a majority Republican um, party, right? The, um, there were 48 United States Senate senators uh, in the U.S. Senate in 1865. Uh, 37 of them were Republicans. Uh, and perhaps a scant majority of those Republican members would fall into uh, the Republican, uh, although it seems likely that the radical Republicans were a smaller segment of that. Uh, the same is also true in the House. There's uh, 191 members of the House of Representatives, uh, and there are 132 of them who are uh, Republicans. So uh, both the House and the Senate are dominated by Republicans. Um, think about why there are so many Republicans in the House and Senate in 1865, right? So I want you to be thinking about that. Uh, so one of the things the radical Republicans want to do is they're going to, uh, they're going to pass legislation to protect the freedmen population in the South. And it's it much of it circles around um, the passes of a legislation that is under the banner of the Freedmen's Bureau. This is going to be a bureau, a, a congressionally funded and created entity whose task it is um, is to deal with a myriad set of things in the American South in this post-war period. It's going to deal with uh, the freedmen themselves. It's going to serve as sort of a refugee um, agency to care for uh, these folks. Um, it's going to serve as a role of um, overseeing and mitigating uh, contracts between workers and uh, landowners. It's going to uh, provide public relief for those who are destitute. It's going to uh, help in the education of uh, the former slaves or uh, others who need education in the South. And so it has uh, an enormous number of tasks uh, that it is uh, set up to handle, right? And uh, it's only funded uh, for the first year. And so in 1865, with the, the war concluding, uh, the, that one-year cycle is coming up on this Freedmen's Bureau entity. And so the radical Republicans are pushing for another year, add another year to it. Um, the, uh, the enormous amount of tasks that are, are 
uh, part of the mandate of the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, there's simply, you, you can't achieve all of them. And you certainly can't achieve all of them with the number of uh, people uh, who are assigned to it and with the assets that they could uh, command. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau does not receive a lot of funding. Funding is very, uh, the money in itself is very political. It's tied to the political interest of various folks. Um, there aren't a lot of people hired at its uh, peak. The number of people working for the Freedmen's Bureau was 900 agents for the entire 11 states of the Confederacy, right? So um, there are um, a small number of people who are charged with this task. Uh, the, the tasks they are as, uh, uh, assigned to deal with are overwhelming. There's so many different things that the Freedmen's Bureau has to do. Um, and uh, so it's facing enormous difficulties. Uh, and is you know, the intent may have been to provide uh, some sort of bridging mechanism to uh, ease uh, the reconstruction of uh, relations in the South, uh, as well as aid the freedmen. Uh, but the, the series of tasks were overwhelming. But uh, re-upping this for another year is one of the priorities of these radical Republicans. They also want to uh, pass a civil rights bill uh, in order to protect the rights of the freedmen because they are alarmed at what these newly elected governments are doing uh, in their relations with the freedmen population. They're particularly outraged by things such as uh, the black codes that are passed, and we talked about vagrant street and apprentice laws and other types of legislation that is passed uh, to um, really unfairly uh, control the, uh, the freedmen population in the South as laborers, right? And so they're upset about this. Um, and so uh, the thing to bear in mind, Congress passing a civil rights bill, that's federal legislation. Federal legislation would trump uh, that local and state legislation, which is what the uh, black codes are. So this, these are ideas that they have. And so uh, one of the thing that um, the Congress has uh, is a power. And as Gelder talks about, is that Congress has a very different vision of what um, secession means. For Congress, uh, the states leaving um, in uh, forming the Confederacy means they have renounced their state uh, status and so they need to come back into the Union in a fashion that is similar to incorporating new territories. That direction is under the control of the legislature, right? And so the uh, previous, the uh, presidential election was uh, largely driven on Lincoln's view that um, they couldn't leave, ergo they hadn't lost their state status. Well, for the radical Republicans and the Congress, they say, oh yeah, they've renounced their state status. So the, the method to get back in is going to be um, similar or more similar to the approaches that we bring new territory uh, into statehood status, which was a legislative effort. So you already have those sort of uh, the theoretical uh, differences, right? But it plays out in a very practical sense. And um, I always appreciate that uh, in American history that there are events that illustrate um, how these processes operate in relatively contemporary times. And I'm going to uh, draw your attention to the uh, uh, first election of Barack Obama. Barack Obama was a senator from the fine state of Illinois. And uh, he gave up his Senate seat in order to be sworn in as president, which means that there's an empty Senate seat uh, to be filled. And in uh, the state of Illinois, uh, prior to uh, a special election or tying it to the electoral cycle uh, to fill that seat of senator, it gives the governor uh, uh, time to install someone in that position. Uh, the uh, governor, a man by the name of Rod Blagojevich, um, was uh, recorded, uh, surreptitiously recorded by um, uh, police investigators who were investigating corruption uh, in his administration in which he uh, was uh, uh, recorded as stating um, that this Senate seat was his golden ticket uh, and he was not gonna give it away free, he was gonna sell it to the highest bidder. So uh, as Blagojevich is, uh, as this information is um, released and he's being investigated as part of the investigation, well, he had appointed somebody to the Senate seat 
Uh, and in the United States Congress, there was a lot of suspicion about how this person named to fill that seat had gotten the seat. Uh, so there's a practice in the United States Congress uh, that at the start of each session, the duly recognized members from the state and congressional districts of uh, various uh, states of the nation, when they come to the Congress, they have to be officially sworn in. And when they're officially sworn in, they're recognized as being members of the Congress. And so they can, um, you know, what they say can be recorded in the congressional record and they can involve themselves in the activities of the Congress. But they have to be uh, read into the record first by the Sergeant of Arms. So what happened when uh, Mr. Blagojevich's uh, Senate replacement for Barack Obama came to the United States Senate, uh, the Sergeant at Arms read all the names uh, of people recognized to uh, be sitting in those seats, and he purposely omitted this Senate um, uh, candidate that Blagojevich had put forward. Um, this meant, and in fact, that the Senate was not recognizing him as the legitimate seat uh, holder of one of the two Senate seats from the fine state of Illinois. By not reading him into the record, they blocked him from entering into the Congress to engage in the business of uh, the legislative branch. That's precisely what the United States Congress did in 1865. All these new uh, uh, people elected, some of them the same old rebels who had been in those positions before, came to Washington, D.C. saying, we're ready to take over our slots as being the senator uh, from Florida, the representative from Georgia. Uh, so they showed up ready to be read into the record. Um, under the system Andrew Johnson had uh, uh, facilitated, they were as a result of special elections, the duly elected representatives from these places uh, under the system of reconstruction that Andrew Johnson was promoting. But when it came to the United States Congress, uh, the sergeant in arms under the direction of the radical Republicans did not read their names. What in effect this means was uh, Congress said, no, we're not recognizing these folks as, as the duly elected members. They're not joining us here in the Congress. And so they're blocking uh, these folks from coming in. It's setting up a conflict with uh, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson had his system of presidential reconstruction. He says, um, this is uh, the way it's going to be, and uh, I'm building upon what Abraham Lincoln says, and the United States Congress, most specifically the radical Republicans, said, not so fast. So you have a conflict set up. Uh, on top of this, um, as you know, uh, part of the process of passing legislation is legislation is passed in the Congress, and then it goes to the president for his signature. And if the president signs it into law, then it becomes a law of the land, right? But the president also has the power to veto legislation sent to him from Congress. Uh, and so those pieces of legislation re-upping the Freedmen's Bureau for another year, uh, the civil rights bill that was uh, passed overwhelmingly in the Senate and the House, uh, was sent to uh, Andrew Johnson for signature, and he vetoed that as well. So he kicked that legislation uh, back to the uh, United States Congress. So uh, we have a conflict between the executive branch and the legislative branch. When you have these disputes, unless they're over constitutional matters, uh, the United States uh, Supreme Court or the uh, judicial branch is silent because they have no authority to adjudicate these things unless they're under constitutional issues um, that fall within the purview of the court system. So we have a dispute between the executive branch and the legislative branch. How do we resolve these things in the United States? Well, we have a method. It's called an election, right? So um, these uh, folks blocked by the radical Republicans uh, in the special 1865 election, they're out. And so uh, the conflict uh, between Andrew Johnson and uh, the radical Republicans um, is uh, coming to the fore in 1866. So 1866 is not a presidential election year. <clears throat> uh, Abraham Lincoln won re-election in 1864. His running mate uh, was Andrew Johnson, who was elected as vice president. Andrew Johnson was elevated to the presidency uh, as a result of John Wilkes Booth's uh, assassin's bullet, or uh, his bullet as an assassin. Uh, so uh, Andrew Johnson is going to fill the rest of Abraham Lincoln's term, uh, which would mean that the next presidential year is 1868. 
So this is the 1866 midterm election. Every single member of the House of Representatives is up for election because every single member uh, of the House of Representatives has wins a two-year term. So every two years is a federal election for the House of Representatives. One third of the Senate is up for election as well in 1866 because um, the Senate term is six years uh, and it's staggered. So roughly one third are up for election every two years. So this uh, 1866 election year, uh, this is going to be the opportunity, the first opportunity for the American public to directly have a say uh, in uh, how reconstruction is going. Which side do they favor? Andrew Johnson and his relatively easy terms that he says he's continuing from Abraham Lincoln or the much harsher terms uh, and processes um, uh, offered by uh, the radical Republicans and others in the House of Representatives uh, and, in, and one third of the Senate. So um, this election is a very important election because it's the first time that the American public has, has a voice in deciding this course. And Andrew Johnson makes this election explicitly about his vision because he stumps for uh, people, some of which who are in the Republican Party, many of which are in the Republican Party, that he says, don't vote for that other Republican who's blocking my vision of Reconstruction, vote for this guy, um, uh, Joe Smith, because he's going to represent the interests of me, Andrew Johnson, and a much uh, quicker uh, system of reconstruction. Andrew Johnson's calculation runs like this. He believes that the nation wants to get this uh, reconstruction civil war period behind them and get back to the business of becoming one nation as soon as possible. Uh, he, want, he believes that people may not be excited about what has happened to the freedmen, but that fundamentally they're not going to hold up reconstruction because of the poor treatment of former slaves. That's his political calculation. And he goes around uh, what's called the swing around the circle in which he goes around uh, stumping for candidates in the House of Representatives who are going to pledge to work with Andrew Johnson. On the other side, you have uh, Republicans, many of them radical Republicans, um, some of them uh, Democrats running for re-election, but in particular, uh, people who are arguing that they're going to adopt a harder line, that we cannot allow the, the rebels to win uh, in, the, um, in electoral politics in Congress what they lost on the battlefield, that there has to be a much more onerous uh, process um, to allow these uh, Confederate states back into the nation. They have to pay a cost, and in addition, we did not um, wage so much uh, blood and treasure to free the slaves, only to have them re-enslaved under uh, local and state governments. And so, very stark choice between the two. Uh, so the 1866 election, um, when the returns come in, it is overwhelmingly uh, a victory for these radical Republicans and their vision of Reconstruction, and it's an overwhelming defeat for Andrew Johnson and his vision of Reconstruction. In fact, every single candidate that Andrew Johnson went and spoke in favor of lost their primary or their election. And so um, this ends the period, uh, or begins the, end, begins the ending of uh, presidential Reconstruction, which is going to be replaced with um, radical or congressional reconstruction, uh, which begins after this. So um, this is the American public speaking very clearly that they anticipate the South must pay a higher cost and they're giving uh, the impetus uh, to uh, the United States Congress. The first thing the United States Congress does before they even begin uh, to install their system of reconstruction is they override the vetoes that Andrew Johnson has done on their legislation. They override the veto uh, on the Freedmen's Bureau and they reestablish um, the Freedmen's Bureau for uh, another year of funding uh, and support. They override the Civil Rights Bill that Andrew Johnson has vetoed, overwhelmingly supported in both houses, uh, clearly overriding the veto, as you know from your constitutional studies. 
Um, when the president vetoes a piece of legislation, it goes back to the uh, Congress where it has to pass both the House and the Senate by a two thirds majority, uh, which in both cases it does handily. So uh, the Congress is overturning uh, Andrew Johnson's efforts to block legislation to protect the freedmen. Uh, and uh, with the 1866 election, they're validated by the American public. Uh, this leads us to the passage of a series of legislation known as the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. This newly emboldened Congress passes legislation that has, uh, has some primary uh, things they seek to do. Oh, by the way, I should have uh, put uh, my screen up there before. Uh, let's, let me pause it here. And I'll put up the notes here in just a second. So here's a pause. Okay, and now back, sorry about that. And here's the screen for this. Uh, Here. There it is. Okay, so uh, here, here's a little discussion about the radical Republicans. Uh, you can pause this at your leisure and take a look at those notes. Here's a discussion of um, events uh, in um, the Congress uh, in the period before uh, the 1866 election. Uh, one of the things that Gelzo uh, also talks about, which I neglected to mention, uh, is that in the period before the election, uh, as he says, almost on cue, uh, the white Southerners engage in acts of violence against the freedmen population. Uh, so there's a series of uh, a large notable uh, white riots against the black population um, in uh, Memphis uh, in particular, and New Orleans as well. These were um, violent attacks on the freedmen population, which further um, entrenched the idea that the Southerners needed to be uh, reconstructed or punished. Uh, and that brings us to the 1866 election. So um, this uh, election, uh, when the new Congress is sworn in in uh, December of 1867, um, or excuse me, this, uh, December of uh, 1866, uh, they begin to busily pass legislation uh, known as the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, on which there's uh, some major points. So uh, first, um, the 11 states of the Confederacy, under the vision that Andrew Johnson was promoting as Abraham Lincoln's vision, those states, those states had not lost their statehood status. And so reconfiguring how they get back into the Union was occurring as the state of uh, Florida or Alabama, right? Uh, the radical Republicans say, no. Under the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, you are no longer the 11 states of the Confederacy. You are carved up into five military districts. Uh, I should say, uh, I have under course uh, materials, there's a link uh, to a reconstruction map of the five military districts. So you can see which one, where each state ends up. Uh, but uh, the practical effect is, those independent states, the state of South Carolina, the state of Florida, the state of Texas, are no longer states. They're part of uh, military districts in which ultimate legal authority in those districts lays with the military general there, which ultimately means it's under the control of uh, the federal government, right? So instead of having a state governor, you have a military governor who has the final say uh, over uh, events in that district, not just your state, the military district to which you're assigned. So they have lost their statehood status uh, under this. You are now an occupied military district. Uh, second, um, the uh, Congress uh, disenfranchised um, a much larger segment of the Confederate population. So uh, under the May proclamations, uh, that Andrew Johnson passed, only a small sliver of the white South had lost their franchise, uh, had lost the right to vote, had lost the right to run for office, and he had left that mechanism where they could appeal to him directly. Remember that as part of his personal biography, he hated the slaveocracy, so it must have been uh, very gratifying to him to have them come hat in hand looking for reinstatement. Well, here, 
uh, Congress has said um, they have disenfranchised a much larger percentage of the former Confederate population. Uh, and I have in parentheses five years because it turns out to be five years, and I want to clarify that because when Congress uh, passed this part of the Reconstruction Act, they said until Congress shall uh, issue further uh, uh, rules to that effect. So what they did was they uh, pretty much anybody who swore allegiance to another government, which every office holder in the Confederacy had to swear allegiance to this new uh, constitution, the Confederate constitution, as well as the soldiers and sailors uh, in the Confederate military, they as well swore allegiance to another uh, constitution. So they are shut off, but Congress says, until we in effect say differently. I put in five years because it ends up being five years. These, uh, the, the um, Confederate supporting, uh, or involved white population of the South is disenfranchised for five years. It turns out to be five years because Congress uh, left it vague until they decide differently because they knew they couldn't keep them disenfranchised forever. If uh, you disenfranchise former rebels forever, all you're doing is setting up a mechanism uh, for them to resist occupation, right? So you're setting up uh, the means to establish a guerrilla force because what's in it for them? They're never going to be citizens again. So Congress recognized that. And so they said, until we say differently, holding it out um, as a, a future event. As it turns out, it was five years later that Congress readmitted many of those uh, former uh, Confederate office holders and Confederate um, uh, military leadership and regular Confederate soldiers, in some cases, to come back into the Union as uh, as, fran as uh, enfranchised citizens. But in the meantime, they're cut out, right? And they don't know how long it's going to be. Nobody knows. Congress makes a decision in the future. It turns out to be five years. But at this moment, they're locked out. So now a sizable percentage of the white voting public in the South has been disenfranchised, lost the right to vote, uh, to hold office, um, to serve on juries. Their citizenship rights are uh, uh, cut off because of this uh, Reconstruction Act of 1867. They also give voting rights for freedmen, right? So the former slave population, the male former slave population, uh, women are still excluded from the vote. Uh, the male uh, population of the South, uh, of the freedmen population, are now given the franchise. And unsurprisingly, they're going to vote for Republicans. And so this system uh, is much more onerous. They also, as part of these Reconstruction Acts of 1867, dictate that prior to readmittance into the Union, Southern states will have to ratify uh, the 14th Amendment. The next lecture, uh, we're going to talk about this, uh, the amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Um, we're going to pay particular attention to the 15th Amendment, or the 14th Amendment, excuse me, uh, as we talk about um, how they are readmitted to, the, uh, readmitted to the Union and why the 14th Amendment is so important. And also why the radical Reconstruction uh, um, leadership adopted policies in this fashion. But in the meantime, uh, to end today's lecture, this is the end of presidential Reconstruction and uh, the beginning of uh, radical or congressional Reconstruction, which is a new phase, okay? Um, I will see you next time. Keep up with your readings, and I'll see you in discussion section.